Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to Season 2 of The Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by voice artist and actress Penelope Rawlins. Penelope, it's such a joy to have you on the show. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. It's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for wanting to come on. It's such a pleasure to chat with you. Well, it's fantastic what you're doing with this podcast. I'm, I'm loving hearing them as well. They're great. Thank you very much. That means a lot. There's so much fun. It's, it's you know, some of my, uh, it's, it's my favourite part of the week, I'd say, uh, getting to chat to people. It's lovely. So yeah, thank you once again for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. I'd love to start by asking a little about your background and how you found yourself acting, you know, voice acting and, and then entering the world of audiobooks. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, I started way, way, way back um, at a performing arts school at Elmhurst Ballet School, actually. So um, my sort of background started in dance Um, and I used to perform with a um, semi-professional company. Uh, This is when I was growing up in the States and I I loved it. And then when I um, was at this performing arts school, I realized that it was the acting in dance that I was loving so much. So I um, decided to pursue an acting route rather than a dance route and then mm. went to drama school. Um, and then it was there that I um, I started initially doing um, audiobook, uh, not audiobook, sorry, um, uh, voiceovers yeah. um, for you know, young kid, kid voices, both British and American, because I've grown up in the States. I sort mm. of do native in, in both. And then... As I was, you know, I left drama school and I'm, you know, an actress and I was working in a theatre and in between the the theatre jobs I was doing voiceovers and, and that was coming more and more regularly. Yeah. And um, and I I then sort of started really enjoying the sort of the variety in, in voice work and how, you mm. know, you, you visually it doesn't really matter what you look like, it's what you sound like. So the, 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 the casting um, bracket sort of widened. And um, so I was doing, you know, animation and some computer games and then started. I'd always, always, always wanted to do audiobooks. And so um, I uh, I eventually started, got my first audiobook and absolutely loved it. And yeah. I guess the, the rest is history, really. It's sort of um, it was a world that I I felt so free and at home in and um yeah. and, her, and continue to do so really so that's fantastic so as you say that you mentioned uh, growing up in the states when did you make it over back to the UK well um we met, I came back when I was uh still in high school so 15 16 to, to mm. Elmhurst to, to yeah. the four-year art school but I was a day student and then my parents moved back to America like a year later and they're like what do you want to do? Do you want to come back with us? Do you want to stay and be an overseas student? And I, I was so settled in the performing world. I didn't really want to leave that yeah. world. So then I became a, an overseas student. So I was sort of going backwards and forwards. So really, I was still technically in America, you know, into my 20s because my parents still lived there and I was going to see them in between, you know, term times and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a huge, it's been a huge part of my upbringing, really. Yeah, fantastic. So you mentioned um, always kind of having your eye, uh, or I guess ear, on audiobooks. Um, like, what what was it about audiobooks that kind of drew you in as a performer? Well, I never forget the first time I listened to an audiobook um, as a as an adult. Um, I think it was Anna Massey doing a um, a Dickens, and I was. Um, I, I, it could have been great. I, I can't actually remember which title it was actually, but I remember just being amazed that one person could tell the whole story and yeah. she was doing you know you know men women of all ages and I, it just sort of like stopped me in my tracks you know I was listening and pottering around in the flat and everything and just going like that's so clever like because yeah. I'm seeing these people I'm seeing this man even though this woman is 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 telling the story and I just found that 
just terribly exciting actually yeah um and uh yeah i suppose that kind of that drew me in and i thought and i was also you know as actors you know we love storytelling mm. and i love the journey of storytelling um in 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 whatever form and so sitting with a book and telling a story to other people is it's kind of like a dream really um because uh, the stories are always so varied as well so you go on yeah. these different journeys you know each time you, you you do a book as you know um and uh I just found going into the different worlds of people's lives just just a very exciting place to be and you know yeah. to do it for a living I sort of you know kind of pinch myself really <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. When um when first starting, when doing those um first uh, audiobooks and perhaps even still now, um what was an aspect of audiobook narration that you found challenging, you know, as opposed to animation and and all the other various forms of voiceover work? I yes, I remember when I I got my first book, it was um called The Missing by Jane Casey, really good book actually. Yeah. Um and and I remember reading it being like, but there's lots of men in this book. And you know, and, and big men as well and, <laughs> well you know given the fact that I you know I'm sort of known for doing children's voices as well I was like how's this gonna work so it did take a lot of like um practice um yeah. and uh, uh yeah and trying trying things out and I think that was probably you know going to registers that I don't usually go to um yeah. and I, I always find I get this is confession of a narrator I always get really burpy when I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's like more air I'm taking in, but there's a lot of burping going on in my food when I've been doing male voices. <laughs> you've um you've worked with the biggest publishers on the most just the most amazing books. And I just wondered, have you any advice for narrators who who are listening, who are perhaps in their early stages of their journey and on how to best, you know, increase their chance of being asked back to work with clients once given their first opportunity? Um, I would say, um, be preparation really, it's all mm. in the prep. Um, mm. and I think you can never be too, um, underprepared. Uh, if you are, um, if you are clear about your character voices and you're consistent about them as well, mm. um, and you've done the work you've done, mm. you know, you've done the research that's needed because there is a lot of, um, pre-recording work that needs to be done it is mm. time consuming but it's it's necessary in order to produce you know a good quality top quality book yeah. audio book. um so my advice is it, it's all in the um the preparation in terms of being asked back you know a second mm. time yeah that's interesting that you mentioned prep because it is actually the most requested topic uh to, to for me to ask guests about on this show so i was yes yeah, so i was going to lead into what does pre-production look like for you when when working on an audiobook? What could you could you maybe give us like a brief overview of everything that goes into your to your uh, prep? Yeah, sure. Love, yeah, love to. Um, so you know, a, um, a book comes in, and um, I will um, uh, I'll obviously read it. <laughs> but as I'm <laughs> as I'm reading it, I I have a notebook. I've got it right here. You see, look. Oh yeah, um, I've got yeah. many of them actually, um, and uh, uh, I make a note of the characters uh, as I go along, and I, um, you know, if there's descriptions or whatever, or or even feelings of, oh, that that person reminds me a bit of such and such, or you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll 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 be making notes al along the way. Um, I'll be making notes of uh, pronunciations which uh, I'm not familiar with and it's interesting because I don't know if you find this when you're narrating but you know there's a lot of words that we I have read in my life that I've not necessarily said yeah. out loud <laughs> yes. and so like all of a sudden you say like is that how you say that um, and of course there's that sort of you know do we say um, do we say it this way or that you know mm. kilometer kilometer I mean there's language is changing all the time isn't it and yeah. and we do get the influences from the states as well so there's always that kind of going on in one's head and, and what's the period you know would we be saying privacy now or privacy you know and yeah that, that 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 sort of um well that sort of detail I think is important yeah so yeah I'll be taking notes and and marking up the script as I go um and um 
sometimes the highlighting comes out um and it's great on i annotate because um got my life changed as soon as i went <laughs> you know, the, remember you know when you had all the paper like the big piece of paper with all your highlighter pens and um anyway uh so um so i do that and mm. obviously i um I, I practice the voices beforehand so i know mm. because i don't really want to be stopping and starting you know mm. whilst narrating i want to be getting into the flow of flow of the storytelling yeah um and uh yeah, I'll you know I'll be doing the research in terms of um, the author as well, in terms mm. of what they've written before and their style. Um, I might listen to uh, a previous audio book that the author has done, um, just to get you know, yeah, just, just anything really, just to kind of build one's knowledge. Um, and uh, if I need to listen to some uh, languages or some accents to you know refresh my memory of mm. them if I haven't done the accent in a long time or um yeah there's quite there's quite a lot isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even started recording by this point um, <laughs> with projects because I know you've worked with Warhammer um on some Warhammer projects and those types of books you know huge fantasy you know huge story there's so many words that aren't real words you know so many places and names that are, are the to for, for me at least just look like a jumble of letters and and I just wonder, and, and of course, with the with the fan base of that uh, of that IP being so passionate and so you know, and rightly so, loving every part of it, I just kind of wondered on projects like that. I mean, that must be a tremendous feat of work to make sure that you know, not only are you saying it right, but you understand all all these worlds that are, are, aren't in our real one. Absolutely, and I am entirely reliant upon the um, producers um, on that, so that, that they can give us the the correct pronunciations because yeah. my guess is always wrong <laughs> I'm, not, I'm pretty I'm pretty consistent of getting it wrong so quite often I'll be like just tell me <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and in terms of getting the the into the world as well um if it's a it's a if it's a series that I'm not familiar with or whatever yeah. um I would be entirely reliant on the producers and and if the authors are contributing as well in 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 this side of the project then them yeah. as well. Yeah, it's just, it fascinates me. It must um, yeah, it must be a lot of fun, but a lot of hard work as is uh, as is all audio books, of course, but uh, specifically ones of that nature. Um, accents, of course, play a massive part in audio performance. Have you a process when undertaking a new accent, um, perhaps one that you, you haven't, you know, attempted before, if it's, you know, a few lines of a, of a specific accent comes up in a book? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, again, I go back to the, the R word of, of, of research, research or research, you know, depending on. Oh, that's the another one. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah I mean, I, um, I'll go on good old uh, the Internet uh and and look for it there i will um i'll listen to as many examples as i can but mm. i'll and i'll practice it but my feeling about accents is that to be really comfortable at home with an accent is you've got to be able to improv in it mm. like in terms of you know fine if you've got one or two th two three lines uh, of this accent and it's a new accent um of course work on it so you've got like two or three lines whatever you know with a new accent you know going through that but then stepping away and um I was trying to sort of I always try to sort of improv and just talk in that accent so that it's not yeah. kind of only those specific words that I can say in that accent yes. because I think it doesn't sound quite so natural whereas if you can naturally just you know um freestyle if you like in the accent yeah. then I think you'll um you'll mentally have a better attitude to, to to it as well and i think it just sounds more it sounds more natural yeah yeah that's, absolutely that's my tip anyway um what, when narrating in a u.s accent or when doing u.s I, I know you've spent a lot of time there and things and that may come more natural but is there can have you just got that to the point where you can just switch you know, immediately as you would you know through the audiobook is there, is there yeah, no, yeah yeah because because i grew up in the states um i was the all-american kid <laughs> so I would speak in a, with an American accent, even though I'm British. I was you know, yeah. born born in Surrey, um, and moved over there when I was when I was young. So I would sort of from a very young age, it was mm. kind of mad, really. I would go to school and I would have an American accent, um, and then I would come back home and I'd have my British accent, <laughs> <laughs> and then people, my friends, would ring me. 
and I then feel very confused because I'm like, I'm at home. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it sounds a bit schizophrenic, doesn't it? But, <laughs> but that's kind of how, that's kind of how it is. That's how I am. Um, yeah. So actually for, for the, for American, I, I jump backwards and forwards, you know, yeah. sort of very easily and naturally because I, it's a, it's a native accent for me. Yeah, that's fair. You, um, you're of course no stranger to working on both video games and animation projects as well as audiobooks. I'd love to know how approaching one character as opposed to, you know, narrating an entire book, how does that change your process as a performer? Like, does it allow you to go much deeper into the character? Are you spending more time? Do you, do you, um, yeah, is there, could you talk us through your, your process of, of, uh, of, of adapting a character when, when in video games or animation? Yeah, um, to be honest with you, I think it's pretty much a similar process in terms mm. of whether or not it's, you know, two lines or, you know, a mm. hundred. Obviously, the more you're you're working on, on a character, the more um, familiar you will get. Mm. And obviously, when I've done, um, you know, animation series like Rainbow Rangers, which is three series or whatever, that was yeah. over a number of years. So, you know, it was sort of every time we, we, we came back to it, it was like revisiting an old, you know, an old friend. Yeah. Um, so that's that sort of grows with you I think as you do the as you do more and more of the of of that role but I think in essence the the approach to finding the voice comes from uh, you use the same processes in terms of asking those questions of you know who they are Mm -hmm. um how old they are um you know their personalities and and then they're also thinking about who your audience is as well you know my approach Mm -hmm. to um voicing children's books is is different to how i would be approaching you know psychological thrillers yeah you know i i I always always have in my head the audience or the listener um yeah fantastic do you get much time to like prep a script for animation or video games do you have much time you know because obviously with audiobooks you're you know not all the time of course but you know most often you're able to have a bit of time to digest that script and mark up and things is it like i've just wondered like how much time like on average do you get with the material before going into a recording session well i think like with um with audiobooks it, it just varies from project to project mm. and obviously with a book you've got so much more to to be prepping actually so even though you might have more time you've got a lot more volume to get through than you have perhaps an animation series uh you know an animation episode so it really does vary in terms of how long you get beforehand because they might be still working on the script um i mean we can we have that you know with audiobooks don't we in terms of getting the final drafts and stuff so Mm. um that's not a really definitive answer for you there but it all really does just depend on project to project yeah, that's fair. Um, another question, which is very similar to the audiobook one, um, so I do understand if it's if it's the same answer. But I just wondered um, if you had any advice on working with directors and engineers. You know, when voicing, um, you know, for an anim- animation episode or something, is there any sort of advice that you have um, for for those who find themselves in that situation? Just really want to make that good impression and really want to make sure that they're not annoying, you know, their 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 team around them by doing something that they're unaware of, you know. I think just possibly just being open to what's being presented to you, you know. Yeah. Um, of course, it's it's great to go in with some ideas and, uh, you know, maybe a variety of ideas. You no, know, not just sort of this is the one way I can say this and, you know, mm. that's it. So, you know, come in with ideas, but also be open and be sort of malleable to to, to try different things as well. Um, yeah. I think is, is is a good way in. Yeah. Do you already have the voice of that character kind of ready before you go into a session or is there an element sometimes of tweaking it in front of the director? Like, has that work already been done or is it on the fly sometimes? Absolutely. I mean, it's a very uh, collaborative, creative process. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, of course, you know, you've got your um, you've probably got your reference from, you know, when you audition for the part um, Mm. and, you know, you might have some feedback in terms of, you know, if they want to do it lean more in one way than than another um yeah. and then when you're in there yeah definitely it's um it's a collaborative uh creative process in terms of just getting it right in terms of all the finite details yeah. that are required yeah auditioning um auditioning is a huge aspect of the vo and audiobook world of course 
do you have any advice for auditioning? Like, is there a certain mindset one has to adopt to avoid, you know, getting too obsessed or, you know, uh, about a particular job? You know, if one comes in and think, I really got to have this. And then, of course, that can lead to disappointment and, and all the rest of it. Is there, have you got any advice on dealing with that constant state of being in that, am I going to get this, am I not <laughs> face? It's a nightmare, isn't it? Because it never <laughs> stops. And actually, the, the longer you do it, I don't necessarily think it's, any easier maybe you just kind of get a little bit more kind of toughened to it but yeah and I because I'm sort of nodding nodding as you're saying that you know when you get those ones that come in you think god I really want to get this one and then (laughs) you know whether or not you get it or not it's not necessarily down to what you think it's down to I I I think you know in terms of it could be a variety of different reasons so um I guess doing the prep giving it your best but maybe giving yourself a timer as well Mm. I mean I have children so they are my timer because (laughs) I can't spend (laughs) sadly three hours yeah (laughs) fine-tuning you know um a one-line audition but um uh you know maybe giving yourself a time limit right right by this point that's it no more takes because you know you, you you can get yourself into a real um tizzy I think if if you yeah. kind of get too stuck in it so maybe that and then afterwards just keep yourself distracted and do other things mm. I mean, I'm just talking from experience you know like yeah it's definitely something that I, I chat with a lot of the writers um about as well as um uncertainty um which I guess is you know can affect you know a lot of people but especially as in in the arts and and doing this line of work is that you're not always you're not always sure of what you're going to be doing six months down the line you know um, and I just wondered, like, how are you dealing with uncertainty as a, as a you know, in, in you know, with career and, and jobs coming up? I don't know if I am, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a way of life maybe I've just got used to. Yeah. Um, and I don't I don't look too much into the future because it changes so quickly in such a mm. short space of time, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I sort of deal with sort of month to month I think um and obviously you know I'm not sort of I'm aware that you know one, one has to be making a living and stuff and and looking ahead at the diary and and also just working around other you know life logistic things so yeah I think um yeah I think I I think I sort of stay at, well, maybe too much in the moment I don't know um but I think if I worry too much about the future then I don't I don't enjoy the present. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's I think that's um, that's really important. Actually, it's a really good point. I've been chatting with narrators about that, and it's something that I get asked about to ask guests um, about this because I think uncertainty and dealing with it and the necessity of dealing with it is something that puts a lot of people off from chasing their you know artistic dreams. I think um, you're right. Yeah, and that's, yeah. it's kind of the nature of the the business, isn't it? And that yeah. as artists you know whether or not we're we're acting on, on stage or screen or with a, with a, with the microphone there's it's not like you've signed a contract and you now have got work for 10 years you know in, in another yeah. job it is it's 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 like it's being self employed and um it's it's what we sign up to i suppose yeah yeah absolutely i wanted to um just change route if that's okay and ask about playwriting um, this is actually something that is um, of big interest to myself. I'm, I, um, I've written a few plays and I'm, I'm attempting to write better plays um, as, one, <laughs> as one needs to. And I know that you've written a few plays yourself. And I just kind of wondered, um, has, has writing always been on the cards for you as well as acting and, and all of that jazz? Oh, it's so lovely to talk about this. Um, it hasn't. And I wrote um, Pigeons, which is yeah. um, my first play. I've never considered myself a writer in any, in, yeah, in, in, in any way. And um, a couple of years ago, um, I I wrote this this two hander um, for a very dear friend of mine, um, Jill Freud, and um, it's about a uh, um, an elderly uh, um, lady who you know is of the streets um mm. and a young man and they meet on a, a park bench and um uh, they they chat and um yeah they sort of they share they share a little bit about themselves and it's a, it's kind of based around communication and and the, mm. the dreaded mobile phone and and um 
and whatnot. And anyway, so I, I yeah, I put that on in 2019 um, and uh, as, as a theatre play. But I have yeah. just recorded the radio version. Oh, fantastic. And, and it's so bizarre that you've asked, asked me this because I'm currently trying to get it's all produced and mastered and finished. Mm. Um, uh, and I am trying to get it out on the waves you know somehow yeah. Yeah. um so that's that's my current project outside of the booth is um trying to get it out there but yeah and then I wrote a, a second two-hander um called Mama which I haven't done anything with yet um yeah. I'm probably going to do it as a as a radio play as well yeah um and that was kind of that well that's based on um a young young mum grappling with the um the challenges of of motherhood but I, I, I loved the experience of writing and it surprised me actually in terms of, you know, when you, people ask me, oh, well, you write. I'm thinking, do I? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've written two plays, but that's yeah. it. And, and I want to write more. Um, yeah. It's, it's having that, that time and all those ideas that I scribble mm. down. It's, it takes, I admire, I admire writers so much that, that, that discipline of sitting down my yeah. husband has 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 written a novel and called um, the lizard, and he's currently working on the, the 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 sequel to it. And I'm just like, I don't know how he did it, like sitting <sighs> down and just writing, and yeah, you know, uh, the the length, the duration. I do, I John, I don't know how you do it. Like you said, you've written <laughs> loads of stuff. It's like it just takes a lot of time, doesn't it? I think. It does, yeah. Over and I, I never claimed that they were good stuff, um, it was, <laughs> but it was, yeah. I mean, that's something that I'm struggling with myself, and just keeping it consistent. I'm try, I try and write something every day, even if it's just like a diary entry, you know. Um, try and write something. Um, but yeah, I was kind of wondering when you had the idea for pigeons. Was it the? Did you have the idea like first, and then said, "I've got to do something with this because it's nagging at me," or was it more of a, "I'm going to write a play." And then you developed it from there. No, it was the first. Uh, yeah, yeah. What you said. Um, I I was frustrated because um, I think it's so it gets so much harder when um, when you get older. You're an actor, and there's less mm -hmm. work opportunities. And I was thinking about um, my friend Jill, who's a fantastic actress, and um, mm. uh, and in her later years, and I just thought. God, I'm gonna write a play for her, you know. Mm. And then I just sat and I and I I happened to be I was having a lie in actually. Um and I came downstairs and I told my husband, I said, I've got a play I think I'm gonna write. And I sort of told him the sort of the initial story. Yeah. And then I think it was that summer when we were on holiday and I was uh reasonably heavily pregnant with um my second. So I wasn't like running about and wasn't doing much sunbathing. So I thought, well, I'll write yeah. it then. Yeah. And then the story sort of developed more and more. And so it wasn't like I'm going to, I've, I never had that thing of like, I'm going to sit down and write a play. What should I write about? It was sort of the inspiration was with her and getting something for her to do. Yeah. Um, and it kind of, my ideas sort of came from that really. And, and the relate basically the relationship between the two of them. And I never really understood this phrase when, when writers have said, oh, it kind of wrote itself. It really did just write itself because I saw the two characters so clearly in my head mm. and I just got them chatting. And I, I yeah. it, with this one, I found it quite easy to write. Yeah, that's fantastic. Did you find that having worked on, you know, of course, being in plays and, and working on story and, and you know, um, reading scripts, you know, more days than not, did you find that changed the way that you viewed a story when you were writing? Has that has that helped at all? You know, reading books like for for narrating audiobooks purposes for being in place. Did that at all kind of help that process in any way? I think it might have done. I mean, the dialogue um, I found uh, easy to write, but because maybe I was just aware of what it's like as an actor, mm. you know, speaking dialogue. Um, so perhaps so. I think perhaps I did, um, and it well it all sort of feeds into itself really in terms of mm. what your experiences are and um, yeah I think I think it did actually that's a yeah. thing I've not thought about but yeah I think it has yeah and so you mentioned wanting to write more in the future and of course I know that you're busy with the the uh, audio drama versions of of these stories so you are you wanting to write another play is there another play idea on the horizon. There is, there is. I've got quite a few actually. Um, I seem to have like got into a stuck, stuck into a rut of two handers. 
Yeah. I need to I need to bring a third person in. And I'm not quite sure how or what story that is, or even a fourth person. Um yeah. But yeah, no, that I've got lots. I've got a couple that are sort of there, um, yeah. as I say, there sort of in the back of my head. Um, and I need, I think, I need, I need a holiday to be able to, <laughs> yeah. to reflect on it a little bit more and just and give myself the time and and the yeah. discipline. It, it's such a discipline writing, and as you, yeah. you know, I really admire that. It's such a great thing that you're making sure that every day you're writing something. You know, even if it's a yeah. diary entry or whatever. I think it's I think it's needed and I think also because you know we get so busy and, and it, with work and, and you get projects and obviously not you know some challenges arise on a day and, and that takes over your brain and I think so something that I try to do I try to do every day but it does fail is have like 30 minutes of like daydreaming time whether that's during like a walk or just like in the evening and where I, where I say to myself I'm not going to think about anything and then of course you do start thinking about things but then after a while it starts to turn into the things like characters in plays or stories story point and you start working out those problems you know that that's such a great idea that's kind of like creative mindfulness isn't it yeah I think so I think I must I must admit that it's most of the time you know especially if it's been a really stressful day you'll get a lot of sessions where you're just berating yourself for not doing something right or you know and it doesn't it's not always like that but it's just trying to get because I think daydreaming is such an important part of it and it can often look like procrastination but I think it's I think it's just giving yourself the freedom to to just think and dream, and and then that's where you come up with the the ideas, I guess. You're so right. You're so right. And and I I remember you know my husband going for long walks actually when he was writing his book and kind of going right I need to go and you know I've got to yeah. this bit but I need to figure it out and you know he'd go off writing books so, and and you know as you said daydreaming yeah. but yeah that's a great idea. I might <laughs> try that myself. <laughs> so do, do you have any like um like writing practices or anything, you know, because you hear stories. I've, I've interviewed a fair few authors on this uh, on this podcast and and some uh, different, you know, they have the perfect setting, they have the light a candle, they have the classic music, you know, doing it, and then others are just, no, I just need to get the words in. That's what matters. Where, where do you fall on that, on that, you know, spectrum? I'd like to be in the, the, the first one that you described, <laughs> but sadly, no. Um, yeah, it's like I'll, I, I'd write whenever i can you know yeah. evenings on my own um, perhaps um but yeah because what you know with two small children and you know full-time work is quite it's quite hard to find these these moments yeah. to do that and i need to get better at that i'd like to get better at giving myself more time yeah um so no i don't have lighting candles and uh <laughs> yeah, but I, I really want <laughs> i really want to light some more candles um yeah uh yeah i mean i'm getting better at sort of having trying to to mark out each, each day or as much many days as possible that sort of time to to myself to do something that is that is creative and something that i'm feeling a call to do i'm really mm. into aromatherapy actually and i'm oh, nice. doing an aromatherapy course um and uh so that that's another thing that i sort of focus my attention on um um and I might light a candle when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't light a candle in the booth, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's hazardous. Can you imagine? <laughs> do you, how do you um how do you structure your day when working? Um, I, I, I presume then, but the, the majority of the time you work in home booth, home studio. Um, you get to structure your day. Like how how do you kind of you know take a look at your day? Is it is it very structured? Do you have to kind of roll with the punches of the day? How do you, could you take us through like a typical working day in the life? Yeah, I mean, it's very varied because I'm not always in my booth. I go into mm. town as well, working in London in the studios. So, mm -hmm. um, and I like that variety. I like mm. being able to go in as well as work from home. Um, uh, I like being around people. Um, and there, but there are times also that, you know, having two young children and dealing with schools and nurseries and everything, there, there are times where it actually... It, it can work quite well in terms of um life logistics yeah so if i am having a day at working from home um i will um you know we'll we'll get for the day i might go for a walk or a run in the morning before i start um mm. and um i i'm getting much better at taking breaks i don't know about mm. you but i found when i first started recording from home i was really bad at taking breaks mm. um 
and I'm not I'm not one generally who likes to take loads of breaks. I, once I'm in the zone, mm. I kind of like to stay in the zone for a bit. But obviously, if one's working with somebody else, they might want to take a break. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> one has to be <laughs> mindful of that. But if yeah. I'm working solely on my own, I've had to get much better about um, making sure I have you know proper breaks. And when I have yeah. a break, when I'm at home, I'm not doing a chore or something you know <laughs> yeah yeah I know. yeah yeah go on no see, I, I i resonate with that so much i think it's because my, my partner's a teacher so she's out at the local school uh and she does you know full proper day's work but because i'm you know my office is just you know so near everything that kind of needs to be done around the house i always i, I when i was starting I, I i felt a bit guilty that i, I wasn't doing well you know i was going to put the washing on or something and i ended up just doing random things and it took me a while to say no this is you are at the office now you know it's so kind of important thing. yeah i mean I've, mm. i did that myself you know being with a client down the line and right we'll just have a 15 minute break I was running around the house like a lunatic, you know, like <laughs> doing some some sort of chore or other. And it was like this: if you wouldn't be doing this if you were in a studio in London, you know, you'd be yeah. sitting down, having a drink, you know, maybe yeah. having a snack. So uh, yeah, we we learn as we go, don't we? <laughs> when what can we often find you doing when not performing, when not writing? You know, is have you got any other sort of interests? I know we already mentioned um, one before, but what can, what can we often find you doing when when not in the booth? Um, well, yeah, so I've mentioned the aroma, aromatherapy. Um, obviously, I'm with my children a lot, but um, I took up running a couple of years. Well, I took up running, actually, in the lockdown, because oh, at nice. the time we were we were living in a flat, and I used to hate running. I mean, running mm. used to just make me cross. Um, but it was one of those things where I was like, I gotta get out. So yeah. I, you know, I started um, very gently, and um, I'm not a big, big runner. I don't go very fast at all. Um, but I did a half marathon last year, which was nice. really exciting because I never in a million years thought I would ever do something like that. And I loved it. Yeah. Um, so I think I do enjoy having my running time because it's sort of just, out, you know, outside um, running through the woods or you've got lots of woods near us and stuff. Um, yeah. uh, so I enjoy doing that. Um, I enjoy I enjoy going to the theatre mm. um, and... What else do I do? Well, I'm getting into gardening as well. Nice. Um, I love a garden scent. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very calming. My husband yeah. will be like, do you need to go to the garden centre? I'm like, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm hoping that at some point we will see spring. I think today yeah. we've got a little bit, we've had a little bit of a glimpse because this winter does seem interminable. Mm. Um, uh, so... I definitely I'm enjoying learning more about plants and doing gardening and and, and whatnot. So yeah, so yeah. Do you find um, since starting running and, and and running frequently, do you find that helps when in the booth and when having to stay kind of seated and in the zone? Because um, that's something that I find. I mean, I don't run as often as I should do. But whenever I do, I always know that like so if I do it in the morning and then when I have like a long session narrating a book. Um, you know, throughout the day, I always find I have better recording days when I've tired myself out, you know, physically at the start of the day. Yeah, yeah, I do. And, and it's so because um, it's such a solitary experience. And well, it can be particularly if you're working on your own. Mm. And uh, yeah, as you said, you, you're sitting there and you're, it's for such a long time as well. And you're not, it's not like, you know, I know other people sit in their jobs, but they, they'll move about more, won't they? Whereas we've yeah. got to, we can't do that. No. <laughs> So I think, yeah, that the running, um, it, it does help. It just, it, it sort of clears the cobwebs and it, it gets the the endorphins going and it moves all the muscles about. And, you know, cause I don't know about you, but I can find after a long day of recording as well, I can get quite sort of stiff in the, in oh, the yeah. shoulders and stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah, no, it is, it's good. I had to start, I had to start doing yoga um, before and after sessions because I was finding that I, I was, because I was hunched, well, not really, I don't know what I was doing with my neck. Um, but maybe just like kind of leaning slightly forwards um, in my in my position and it was just ruining my back and spine you know it was horrendous <laughs> like, I know and you don't necessarily have someone going come on sit up or whatever yeah exactly and then like I try and get a nice posture and then when I'm getting more and more into the book I'd just start to hunch down and just that little bit more or maybe put a little bit of pressure on you know the way that I was sort of bending my neck it was uh, do yeah. you find your your posture changes depending on characters and stuff Yes. 
Yeah. I find that when I narrate non-fiction, I'm a lot more kind of authority, <laughs> really like a figure of authority. Um, that, yeah. But what's a question you wished you were asked more? It's such a good question, John. It's sort <laughs> of like blindsided me slightly because I'm like, what's a question that I wish I was asked more? I might, I might have to come. Am I allowed to yeah. come back and th- and think about that one? Of course, yeah. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big one of mental health. Like, mm. and I've actually, you know, I've had the privilege of doing a, a, a couple of audio, narrating a couple of audio books with regard to mental health. So, I think it would probably be something around that in terms of. Mm just not not me in just me specifically i just mean in general i i wish we 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 perhaps checked in with people you know Mm. the how the how are you is a Mm. is a more of a genuine run you know i'm not not meaning that every time you see someone there needs to be a counseling session but yeah you know um uh that's the only thing that's 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 leapt in my mind i must admit i love that one about you know sincerely asking someone how they are and and not just not just in passing, not just you're right, but sincerely, are you? How are you coping at the moment? Is everything okay? Yeah, um, and it could it could be great, or it could be, I don't know. We're so programmed, aren't we, to be like, yeah, fine, thanks, how are you? And you kind yeah. of, go, and of course, you know, when you're walking past a, a, yeah. a neighbor on the street, you know, of course, that's yeah, yeah. Thing, but I think the the sincerity behind that, um, perhaps, we yeah. miss sometimes. Yeah. That's such a good question, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, especially, I don't know whether it's just, you know, in, in, in professional life and things, if it, when people ask how everything's doing, you never kind of want to say, oh, I'm finding this a little bit tricky at the moment. You want to say, everything's wonderful. I'm being booked for all the jobs I've always wanted to do. And yes. Like, you know. yes. Yeah. And then they, and also it's a tricky question when, when people go, you know, you know, how's, got enough work or whatever and you don't want to be like yeah i've got plenty thanks you kind of was like well no i've always wanted yeah. more work thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a fine, it's a fine line to gauge that one <laughs> yeah yeah exactly because especially if you're talking to someone who may have something that they could offer you you're yeah. often finding yourself going i'm i'm perfectly happy to accept anything but i'm also perfectly happy to not yes. <laughs> i'm not needy but i do like stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um but yeah i think that's a really important um topic actually just in just in general life um but especially in what we're trying to do here in the you know in voiceover and the audiobook industry and stuff because i think there is a tendency sometimes um to just to, to sort of put on a brave face um especially with what we were talking about earlier with um uncertainty um and it's it's just kind of one of those things where as soon as i've kind of mentioned it to previous guests they've kind of like sort of um really opened up and going actually no i can talk about this this is a really hard part of what we do um, and it doesn't mean that you you know you're not enjoying you know life as a narrator or a VO actor or whatever. It's just a you know things have challenges and and that's one of them. I think you're right, and it's not something that like you know, fifteen years in or twenty years in that you've kind of nailed and sorted. Like it's always mm. going to be there, and maybe you just get more resilient. But then you know life is very up and down, isn't it? And maybe yeah. we'll have we have some seasons where you know the rejection or the quieter weeks don't bother us so much whereas there's other times where we're needing a little bit more affirmation from the outside yeah. world for whatever reason yeah. um and also it's such it, you know as i've said before it it, it can be quite a solitary job so that mm-hmm. sort of checking yeah. in and talking which is what it's so lovely that you're doing this that you know with the audiobook world community and, and sort of opening up discussion um it's so important because a lot of the time we're spent either with ourselves or perhaps yeah. with, you know, um, an engineer and producer as well down the line or in the studio, or whatever. But it's it's yeah. not a it's not a big crowd of people that we work with at, yeah. at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of those things where it's, you know, you can become kind of quite close to certain people if you, you know, through emails and stuff, especially if you're working with them long term or, you, you know, if you um, I've done dual narration projects with people, and we've had like quick meetings and stuff, but then develop like friendships and check in every now and again. And I think it's strange when you realise I've never met this person lives in America. I've never met them. I'm probably not going to, <laughs> you know, but it's nice to have that sort of connection because it's, you know, I think, you know, obviously was being social creatures. It's yeah. It's nice to do that. Yeah, and share the experience as well. I mean, I've had experiences mm. where some books I've narrated have really kind of, they have, you know, and I'm sure you've had yeah. these as well. And the times when that's happened and I've had, you know, an engineer through the glass and at times, you know, when we've had to stop and I'm like, 
just let me cry for a second (laughs) you know but it's actually a really it's a lovely experience to share with somebody you know like yeah when you're going through that journey journey of of a story of a book whether or not it's fiction or non-fiction you know they're all they're all journeys um and when you can you know you become enwrapped in it so much as you're as you're narrating it and so they do they do affect you sometimes and yeah. I don't know if you have that where you finish I finish narrating and I and I come need to come home and tell my husband all about it you know just to kind of keep it going <laughs> I've done a series when I started a series at the towards the end of la- the last year I narrated the first book, loved it so much that I emailed the author who was, I knew she was just about to finish the second one. And I said, I need to do, I need to do some prep for the second one. Please send it like as soon as you can, oh. just because I wanted to find out what happened. I was oh, so yeah. engrossed. Um, <laughs> oh, it's lovely when you do a series because it's yeah. like, it, yeah, it, it just continues that little bit longer, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as you said before about um, if you do a character over, and uh, you know, a, a fair amount of time, it's like coming back to that character. It's like putting on an old pair of shoes that, you know, that kind of thing. I'd love to end the show by, by just simply asking if you have any upcoming projects that you're excited about that we can look forward to. Um, yes, I have. I've, I'm working on a, um, a Netflix animation at the moment, which... You're never really allowed to talk about anything. So I've got yeah. lots of exciting projects I'm looking forward to. I've got some, um, well, narrating some books at the moment. Um, and I'm being very vague because I just, and, and some computer games as well. Yeah. I, I'm never aware of well, when I'm allowed to actually mention things. So um, yeah. I know I can safely say that I'm working very hard at the moment trying to get my <laughs> radio play out, Pigeon, so I can talk yeah. about that. But um it's a terrible way of winding up a, a, a lovely interview with, with me being so kind of um, uh, secretive about everything. But <laughs> I, I just never know what I'm allowed to say I'm doing, you know, at the right time. Yeah, no worries. I understand completely. On the, on just on just on an off chance of, um, I mean, that Netflix thing sounds awesome it, and it sounds brilliant. I can't wait to when it is released. I can't wait to uh, check out what you've been working on. Do you do you find yourself kind of watching your own stuff <laughs> um, no but my children do or my daughter no. does yeah um my, my son has as well um so they do and I sometimes come in I'm like oh darling thank you you're watching Rainbow Ranger you know? <laughs> <laughs> but no I don't tend to watch my own stuff um or or, or listen to my own stuff I'd much rather watch other people <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think yeah I think I I wouldn't necessarily, I think I'd be too critical of myself with any decision that I made, but I'd want everyone else on earth to be checking it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's a weird one, isn't it? It's a weird one. It Um, is. But uh, yeah, I'll leave my children to watch it. (laughs) I get feedback as well. I mean, I get feedback when I read them stories in bed, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a professional. everything i'm a professional i know what i'm doing i can pick a voice for this character yes but sometimes my uh, my choices are wrong so uh, <laughs> they're harsh casting directors <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well that just about brings us uh, to a close for this episode of the audiobook club um all of the links to penelope's social media and website will of course be linked in the show notes uh thank you so much for tuning in and of course another huge huge thank you to you penelope for joining us oh Thank you so much. This has been such a delight. Thank you. (laughs) Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com.
you'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.